Our first speaker is going to be the state treasurer, um, Mr. Curtis Loftus, Jr. <clears throat> he is the state's private banker, and he oversees more than $43 billion in state funds, including our pension funds. He's the vice chairman of the State Fiscal Accountability Authority, which provides oversight to such statewide policy matters as property, procurement, and debt. He's the chairman of the Board of Financial Institutions, which supervises state chartered our state chartered financial institutions and supervises mortgage originators, lenders, finance companies, payday lenders, and the title lenders, and is a member of the South Carolina Retirement System Investment Commission, which manages the $30 billion in retirement fund investments, which I think he's going to be discussing today. In preparing my remarks to introduce the treasurer, I learned an awful lot about him that I'm not sure if anybody else in the room knew, but um, this was the first public office he ran for, and in a statewide primary, he unseated an incumbent, and that's not ever happened in the history of the state of South Carolina. He won all 46 counties in that election. Additionally, uh, he's a businessman with a background in real estate, and what's really touching to me is that he's got um, a very generous and benevolent spirit. He, in 1999, established the Saluda Charitable Foundation, and he is the principal benefactor for this. They provide nutritional and housing services to orphans and the elderly with operations in Ukraine, Bolivia, and Haiti. They provided over 500,000 meals to the needy and supported medical missions in Haiti when they were most needed. So with that, I give you Mr. Curtis Loftus. He was going to give me a lavalier, but uh, because people like to walk around, I'm usually I like to hide behind something. I prefer usually if it's metal or steel, because sometimes I have people shooting at me. Uh, Diane and Stacy and Scott, thanks a lot. I mean, I, you do this kind of stuff. It's hard work. It's, there's no adequate way to thank you. So I just want to thank you as much as I can. Uh, Treasurer's office is doing okay. I'll tell you, we've we've uh, come a long way. Oop, let me look at my time. We've come a long way in the last five years. Uh, when I came to the treasurer's office, we had one CPA. And I used to think I should call Warren Buffett and say, Warren, you and I have about the same amount of money. Yours is yours and mine is not, but it's the same amount of money. Do you have one CPA looking after your money? But that's what the state thinks of your money. We hadn't had an audit in 25 years. We'd had a little partial audits, but we hadn't had a full gap audit in 25 years. I went to the General Assembly and asked for money and didn't get it. So I had to delay hiring people and things like that. The reason I say that is because they were happy with the situation like it, like it was. We fixed all that. Now we have a, a passel full of CPAs and, and full-fledged accountants. We have people with master's degrees in public finance and, and uh, uh, public policy. Where we went, I used to have half a lawyer. We now have two lawyers. And when you're negotiating contracts that are in the billions of dollars, it's good to have your own lawyer, right? It's good to have a full-time guy. A few basis points either way, and my whole budget can be lost in a month. So it's important. We had uh, a, a lot of work done. We're very happy of some of, about our programs. Got a bit more to go. Uh, our software was the only thing older or that was, uh, hadn't been done or updated longer than the audit had been that 25 years. Software was so old, we had one person, and she retired. And thank goodness she was of a good and charitable spirit, but she would come back and help us because nobody knows how to fix it. It's an ancient and old system. So we're almost through with a multi-million dollar uh, refit of the software system, and it will save us all money and make us feel good and make us more secure. Can't be happier about the unclaimed property uh, program. How many of you have ever checked your name to see if you have unclaimed property? Good, good. Take a guess at how much money we have in that office that belongs to you. Am I got an idea? $503 million. Think about that. People tell me every day that they don't have any money, and we call them every day and say, we've got money for you. I've got, a brief, I've got one in my briefcase. I've got to get down to Charleston the next few days. It's a working class couple. The money originated from the Mill Hill in Chesney, and it's $725,000. They have no idea. The old man worked for Duke back in the days when Duke would pay in partly in uh, stock, 
And he just kept throwing it in a drawer, throwing it in a drawer, throwing it in a drawer. Well, it comes to us, and we finally found it. We, get, we send out checks every day for $10,000, dollars 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 40000 dollars dollars $300,000, $400,000. State agencies have money. Banks have money. Businesses have money. If you hadn't checked, please do. My mother's 82, and my dad's 86, and they have dueling iPads. Of course, daddy's like me. He can't remember anything, so she gives him names, and he looks up people, and they call people from Chapman High School, the class of 1952, or in his case, 47, and say, hadn't seen you in 50 or 60 years, but guess what? You got 500 bucks, you know, or whatever the thing is. So it's a lot of fun. I enjoy that program. I'm a little bit obsessed with it because it's just a lot of fun to go out and find people and repatriate their money to them. What I want to talk to today about is social issues and financial issues. Most people, especially on the right, are motivated by social issues. I know that. I feel that. I get that. I come from a family where we talk politics at every single meal. There's not, there's not a rule against it. And we love these things. But now that I'm in the transactional part of, it, of government, you know, I'm not in the theoretics, the theoretical part of it. I only deal with numbers, things that are supposed to add up. I see really what happens when the public will and special interest hits the road. I see it every day. And it's hard to explain it because if you start talking about finance too much, AIs gloss over and people go to sleep. So I'm going to give you an example. And I'm, going to, I'm going to try out something on y'all. I'm going to explain a, a, a subject I've been talking about for years, but I'm going to explain it in a different way. If it starts to get boring, if it starts to get complicated, let me know. It's not that you're not smart enough to understand this. It's just that I know you have other things to occupy your time with, and you can't spend 60 or 70 hours a week to understand and learn this stuff like I have in the last five years. We have a pension, South Carolina State Pension Program. I am a big believer in the public pension program for state employees. I understand some people don't agree with me on that, and that's fine. But I've studied, and I think it's important, especially in a state like this. Every day that a state employee works, or a county employee, or university employee, teacher, fireman, every day they work, we put money in the bank. And then we pay them every two weeks. There's also that other component, benefits. So every day they work, there's a certain amount of money that we figured that we owe them. So we put that into the bank. And they'll get that when they're due it. It might be 20 years, it might be 30 years, it may be two years. It just depends on when they retire and when their benefits come due. What South Carolina has been doing is instead of putting, say, a dollar away for your retirement benefits, they've been putting 58 cents away. So 42, uh, 40, yeah, 42 cents stays with them. So they've actually underfunded the pension program but they've still got the, 50, uh, the 42 cents. So it's underfunding the pension plan, but it's also a loan because they owed that money. They made a loan back to themselves. So for every dollar that we're supposed to be putting away, instead of putting that dollar away, we put 58 cents away. And we've been doing that on a, on, on a big scale since the year 2000. Does anybody have any idea how much money the 42 cents adds up to after 15 or 16 years? $2 it's a, somebody says $2 billion. It's a loan from the pension fund to state and local governments of $22 billion. That's how much we've underfunded our pension plans. For 16 years in a row, the retirement system and their actuaries have set a number that we're supposed to pay into. They tell us it's the right number. And for 16 years in a row, they've been wrong. And they're fixing to do it again. So every year, it gets worse. Where we used to underfund, and the, and the pension would go up, uh, the debt would go up a couple $300 million. Now it's going up a billion and a half dollars a year. So it's the problem you have when you talk about this is you think, well, how can this be true? These numbers are huge. How can this be? Well, I can tell you how it is. It's because nobody wants you to know. And quite frankly, they've been beating the hell out of me because I want to tell you. 
but I'm on a mission, and I'm going to keep telling you. So what have we talked about? We've talked about every day that, you, that a government employee works, we have to pay them, and we have to reserve money. We haven't been reserving enough money, so that's a loan back to government, and government's been spending that money. They spend it on good things, I'm sure, schools and roads, whatever it is they spend money on. Bad things, too. Green Bean Museum, remember that? But a lot of the things they've been doing. But let's think about this in another context. Republicans in South Carolina, of which I'm a Republican and a conservative, we're proud of saying that we just don't raise state taxes. We have a low tax environment. Well, isn't a $22 billion loan a tax? You've got to pay it back. So we have to understand the context. That's what's been fueling a lot of what's going on. You've been hearing the numbers about the Department of Transportation. $400 million they're going to put to it. Well, guess where that money came from? It's from the underfunding of the pension plan. It's borrowed money. Now, I'm not going to try to explain this next thing. You just have to, have to take it on faith, because if I get into it, the details. But when you borrow money from the pension plan, you borrow at a set rate, and that rate is 7.5%. If I go to the market tomorrow and, and issue uh, $300 million like we did just the other day, uh, we would pay anywhere between 3 and 3.5%. So for the privilege of keeping this quiet, for the privilege of you guys and other people not understanding this, we pay an additional four points, four, uh, four percentage points. So if you go and try to get a mortgage, I don't even know what mortgage rates are now, but if it's 3.5%, and how many people in here would say, well, no, I'm not, I don't want to pay 3.5%. I'd love to pay 7%, 7.5%. Let me pay extra. We underfund the pension plan, and we do it on purpose, and, it, and it's not going to stop. I fight them every day, but the seniority rules in the Senate are such that one person effectively decides what goes on there, and then everybody has a say. For the last four years, I've been traipsing around the state when I could, talking about this issue, and I wondered, why does it really catch on? I mean, why aren't like, cities mad about this? Why aren't counties mad about this? But I was talking to it from the pension standpoint. I was talking about pensioners and what it meant to them. But this is a the pension debt is a general obligation debt. It is our highest level of debt. If there was a war, famine, and depression all at once, this debt still has to be paid. It is the full faith and credit of the state. We have other types of debt. Revenue debt, any more from that, special district debt, all kinds of debt. This is the top debt. Now, we have other state general obligation debt. Anybody want to hazard a guess how much that is? Well, if you put it in perspective, $22 billion in retirement debt, we have $1.37 billion in all of the rest of the general obligation debt together. And that's a conservative number. That's a good number for a state like this. That's a nice number. But the reason we have it is because we stole the money on the other end. Take from one, give to the other. Of that one point, let's call it $1.4 billion, about $400 million is really university debt, and the university has very specific revenue streams. So while it's officially geo debt, you can really pull that out. So now you're down to less than $800 million in general obligation debt. And then we have one debt alone that nobody knows about, nobody will admit, doesn't show up in the paperwork where you can find it, and it's $22 billion. It's a problem. So how do we, how do we fix this? Well, I've been beating my head against the wall forever. But the problem is everybody wants that money. The counties, the cities, everybody wants to spend that money. But at some point, there's a reckoning. At some point, the numbers get so bad. At some point, the debt gets so large, that it has to, something has to happen. I thought it would be this year. I've been quiet for about a year now, maybe six or eight months. I thought, well, surely they're going to have to act now. And boy, was I naive. I mean, I was so naive. They're not going to do anything. They're going to keep kicking the can down the road. Uh, the debt is financed for 30 years. 
That's by state law. It doesn't have to be financed at all. North Carolina is 96% paid. Their funding stream is 96%. We're about 56 or 7. And I don't trust those numbers. I think they're worse. So this is where we go. This is what I see every day. So what do you do about it? Well, one, you guys have to be active. We've got to find a way to get the grassroots interested in finance. Now, I know everybody says, well, I am interested in finance. I don't like taxes. No new taxes, right? Well, that's fine. But they've outsmarted you. They've outsmarted me. I've had my head down on, at my desk. That's why so many of you hadn't seen me. I see so many of my friends who supported me. I can't remember your name because I've been in that office. I've gained 55 pounds in five years. My hair's gone gray. And if I don't wear these little Kmart glasses, I can't see a thing. And I blame it on this pension system. <laughs> so we've got to figure out how to get people involved. If you're the chairman of a local Republican party, if you're the chairman of a Tea Party, you got to find a way to have an award for whoever does the most research and discussion, who brings in a material way, in a meaningful way to your party, how to learn about money. You've got to ask your local representative, your local uh, senator. You've got to ask your county manager and city manager. Ask them to come in and explain a specific topic. And I've got specific topics for you. But if you don't, you'll never get to the bottom of it. The one thing I've learned about finance, and, and it's, it's difficult for people to understand the job of treasurer because nobody knows anything about it. You know, it's supposed to be quiet and on the side. When you elect somebody treasurer, you, in effect, make them a billionaire. There is nothing that a billionaire can do that I can't do, except I do it with other people's money. If I, I can pick up the phone, and in an hour and 15 minutes, there'll be a, a Gulfstream 550 sitting outside, come from Teterboro and take me anywhere I want to go in the world, spend any amount of money I want, do anything I want to do, because I have your money. And that's all across this country. It's a, to these investment commissions, it's treasurers, it's people who manage debt, it's all of these things. So we've got to start paying attention to our money. If we manage the money properly, a lot of these social issues goes away because we've been funding a lot of things by this hidden tax, by this hidden loan. We've been funding that and didn't even know it. The federal government, Jeff's here, he can talk about that. I don't have any concept of what's going on up there. It's just so broken, I don't know what they're going to do. I can't conceive of the amounts of money. I see what happens here in South Carolina. On, on a variety of issues. So we've got to figure out a way to make this fun. We've got to figure out a way that we don't bore ourselves. First thing, you've got to know some rules. When the government is talking to you about money, don't believe a word they tell you. They'll say, well, we've been, we've been, we've been audited. Government accounting standards are like a child's standards. You're wasting your time. That's the first thing they'll say. There's a big article in the Charleston paper yesterday. I loved it. Very good reporting by a Charleston uh, reporter about a scandal that's developing down there. School districts out of whack. They were spending money left and right. Nobody knew. And the former lady said, well, we were audited, and we've got our AAA. Neither one of those addressed the issue. But for nine out of ten reporters, that's all you had to say. I've been... Uh, particularly dealing with the Investment Commission. Investment Commission is a scandal. People should be in jail. Instead, they get bonuses. We have lost eight billion, excuse me, $7.1 billion in the last 10 years through underinvestment, through bad investment choices. We are the worst investment company, uh, uh, commission, the worst in the country. I want you to think about that. Of all the large plans, there's about 40 that are over $5 billion. We're the worst, and we continue to be the worst. At one point, before I got out on about fees, we were paying $1.6 million a day in fees. That's power. You think you're on the local school board? You don't know anything. You think you're a member of the House of Representatives or the Senate? You don't have power when you can point to people the richest people in the world, and give them their share of $1.6 million a day? We have one partnership, three people. We paid them $77 million in fees last year. It's a 10-year contract, and the fees are going up because we're not to our maximum commitment. So they'll make a billion dollars off of us. Think about that. So this immense amount of power, they like it. 
They deny that hubris. They deny that, that privilege and prestige. They deny that going to New York or L.A. or London or Singapore, anywhere we go, we can pick up the phone and call. On my cell phone, I have the name of anybody you've ever heard in finance. And I can call them. I can get them the first call because I've got your $50 billion. Now, I know that the day I retire is the day they hit it. Boom, he's out. And if I call him, I'm a stalker then, right? But as long as I've got your money, they love me. And so as we bring this back to the point, the point is, how do I get y'all interested in this? One, don't believe a word they tell you, because almost always it's not true. Two, they will drive you into the details. Like I started calling it a pension debt. They'll say, oh, Mr. Treasurer, it's an unfunded liability. Not a dime's worth of difference, but that's what they'll do. If I say they lost $7.1 billion, they'll go to the newspaper and say, that's a wrong number. It might be $7.1 billion and a nickel, but that's what they do. And, of course, the reporters believe it. State newspaper and the Associated Press are the only two people who cover the treasurer's office on a regular basis, and they love the Investment Commission. I can go over with facts and figures. I can show them the math. I can show them that we have underperformed by $7.1 billion, and they still love them. Have you been reading about this? No. You know why? Because every editorial page in this state wants roads. They don't care about this massive issue. They want roads. They have their own agendas. And so we've got a lot going on. We need you. We need you to not believe what they say. I need you to find experts in your community and make them heroes. If you can find a CPA or a banker or a former finance guy who wants to be involved, Give them a title. Give them a business card. Put a sign around their neck. You know, put, put a sign in their front yard that says, valued member. He's our finance guy. Do whatever it takes to learn about the money. Because everything you think you know about government finance is wrong. There's no pushback. I've been dealing a lot with debt because I'm the state debt officer. When I came in, it took me a while, but I now realize that for a while, we were probably paying twice as much for bond attorneys as we should have. Now, in the scheme of things, because uh, it's just one fee, it's not huge, but what happens when you pay too much for something? It's a perverse incentive. So therefore, you get perverse outcomes, perverse behavior. If you pay a bond attorney too much, you're going to have, what, too many bonds, churning debt, too many small debts. That's what we've had. I've cut out a lot of that. There's an operation called JETA, Jobs Economic Development Authority. They are completely and utterly unrestrained in their fee schedules. It is a feeding frenzies, frenzy for the bankers, bond lawyers, and money finders. But they're a separate authority, and there's not a thing I can do about it. Housing authority, I got a chance to look at their debt the other day. It's the same way. So it all goes back. There are people in your groups, there are people in your sphere, maybe your neighbor, who understand this stuff, and I certainly will help you. You can make a difference. The information is online, but you just have to find it. If we get people involved, if we start talking about money, then we free ourselves up. A lot of the craziness that government gets into because they have money. If you leave town on the weekend and leave your teenage boy with $500 in cash, keys to a car, he's going to get in trouble. <laughs> I did it, so I know, right? <laughs> and I suspect most of you, I see the smile there. I see somebody else has gotten in trouble. It's the same thing with bureaucrats. And transparency and accountability, which are two terms that I ran on, uh, to coming into office, are now been, been abused so much that I, uh, I'm leery to use them. I like to say meaningful transparency, because they will just overwhelm you. So I'll leave you with that. We've got to find a way so that the finances become more important. Think about, from eternity, all the sayings about money. Money makes the world go around. The, the love of money is the root of all evil. I mean, you can go down all. We've got to get control of the money. The Democratic Party laughs at us on the national level. We may have control of the House and stuff. We don't have control of the money. Same in South Carolina. Between the rhinos, well, to be honest with you, I, I, we got to back that up. Some of my most fierce opponents on the money battle, especially the Investment Commission, are conservative senators. Democrats are my best. And why is that? You go, if I go to the black caucus and talk to the black senators, if I go to the Democratic caucus, they can't be promised anything for a vote. 
But if you're a conservative senator, you can be promised a path to leadership. For it's all over with, my friend, you will be running everything if you just vote my way. And they do. So I have a core of five or six senators who are very, who could perceived as very conservative. They have kept me from reforming the pension system. Not much I can do about it, but lick my wounds and go home. But I'll go back the next day. So uh, I think my time is up, right? Uh, I'm not going to be able to stay for questions. So if anybody had an important question I or one that just burned to ask, I'd be more than happy to do that. Yes, sir. Sure, I'd be more than happy to name names. Uh, the, uh, and I'll tell you how bad it is. There's been a kangaroo court, a special committee. Uh, the Senate has a special committee on the investments of the retirement system, co-chaired by Senator Lurie and Senator Bryant. Senator Lurie and Senator Bryant. Senator Lurie, of course, is a Democrat. Senator Bryant's not. They apologized to the Investment Commission because I was hard on them. Senator Bryant apologized to them. They lost $8 billion or $7.1 billion, and Senator Bryant apologized to them. So Bryant, Massey, Verdon, uh, Grooms, they always, always vote against my reforms. They always vote against me. And so I'm not particularly mad at them about it. I just know it's there, and you just have to work around them. But since I've been working on this, we've incurred $6 billion more in debt. Now, not to I've got to get off stage before I get dragged off. 